Douglas Bristol, welcome to the show. Well, hi, Brett. I'm glad to be here. Uh, so you're a, a professor of history. You got a great book out that I read because barbershops are something we're interested here at the Art of Manliness. Um, but you explore the history of uh, barbershops, particularly black barbers in American history. Your book's called book is called Knights of the Razor. Um, now, barbershops have sort of become this idealized American institution. Um, and for the African-American community, the black barbershop is a, an important, has been like a foundational uh, community touchstone for men. But I thought it was interesting in your book, you, you talk about in your book is that before the 20th century, um, black barbers primarily serviced a white clientele. And in fact, as you highlight in your book, most barbers in America before the Civil War were black. So what was the status of the barber profession in the late 18th and early 19th century in America that caused more black men to go into the profession as opposed to white men? Wow, we we touched on a lot of issues that are involved in this book. Um, as you said, I want to follow up and just talk about how central a place black barber shops are to today's African American community. Um, you know, I'm thinking about the movie Barber Shop right. and the character everybody loves Eddie. You know, talks about it's the black man's country club. I mean, it's it's the one place where black men can speak uh, freely without being under surveillance from whites and think about what they want. That's why civil rights protests were planned there. Uh, in fact, you know, I'm in Mississippi and there's a, where it was a barber shop in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. So many of the men migrated to Chicago that the barber moved to Chicago and called it the Hattiesburg barber shop. But, you know, as you pointed out, my book is about this forgotten chapter in the history of black barbers in the 18th and 19th century, uh, when they served white men rather than black men. And what makes it even more curious when you think about it is if you look at 19th century portraits or whatnot, the guys were pretty shaggy. They weren't that worried about their haircut. You went to a barber shop because you wanted to shave. And the only way to get that was, was with a straight edge razor. So this is a story of the black man's razor at the white man's throat. And of course you're asking a great question. Why, why did that become the common thing in the country? And the answer has a lot to do with understanding uh, race relations. If you think about it, this is still true in many ways. Uh, most white men don't really go to barbershops anymore. And when we go to a shop, we tend to have someone with a different status than us cut our hair. It's a woman. It's an immigrant. Uh, and there's a phenomenon that goes on in barbering that traces its roots back to you know, 16th century Europe when one of the ways that people asserted that they were gentlemen is that they had they took care of their hair and shaved the whiskers from their face. And so uh, to groom yourself was originally thought of as a way of distinguishing, distinguishing yourself in society, and you relied on servants to do that. And it's the association of personal service, you know, tending to your body by cutting your hair and shaving your whiskers uh, that makes barbering associated outside the black community uh, with low status. And so in the 18th and 19th century, we saw uh, the first slave barbers are actually owned by planters of large plantations. This is a handful, maybe 50 planters had enough slaves, a hundred or more, where they could actually have house servants who would include what they called a, a slave waiting man who would often not only um, cut his master's hair and take care of his clothes and shave him, but also would serve as kind of his major domo, helping keep books, supervising other slaves on the plantation. Um, what really is key is, is, and this gets to uh, the strange duality of barbers that you really see in 19th century black barbers. On the one hand, because of the racial difference and early on, because the black men were the property of the people they serve, the status is very unequal. However, uh, going back to Eddie from Barber Shop, you know, he points out one of the functions of a barber is to be someone's fashion coach. And so that really gives that person authority because you go to a barber hoping they're going to make you look good, look hip. And so that gives them power. So there's always a tension in relationship between uh, the white customer and the black barber. I thought it was interesting, too, was going back to this idea of the, the slave barbers for these um, southern planters. Um, you know, they they would often pick um, one of their slaves to be what you call a waiting, what they called a waiting man. And they would 
the waiting men would actually become very genteel. Like they would wear powdered wigs and like have like the nice clothes and they would, they got to listen in on conversations um, with, of their masters with other white men in the elite circles. And so they, they did sort of become elite themselves in a way. Um, and as you said, that the, their masters relied on their, their waiting man to make them look awesome. So, I mean, how did that dynamic there play out between master and slave that where you had a slave who was in some cases just as genteel as you were um cutting your hair and actually giving you information on how to present yourself better well maybe the best way to answer that question is to give an example of a very wealthy planner named landon carter uh, who was a third generation planner who owned several thousand acres over 100 slaves and his really um up and down relationship with his waiting man who was a named NASA. Uh, there's a couple things in this story that really get at important issues. The, the key thing with talking about the slave barber has power because he understands how to make his master look the right way to acquire status is acculturation. Uh, one of the main findings in the last 20 years in the history of slavery, especially in the period before the American revolution, slaves who had learned uh, Anglo-American culture were more useful to their masters, but at the same time, they were more troublesome because they understood the master's world. And to go back to that example of Landon Carter and NASA, uh, Carter actually allowed NASA to treat, he was a, basically a folk doctor. So he treated uh, even members of Carter's own family. Uh, he collected debts. Uh, he took care of his horses, but he also had a really bad drinking habit. Uh, that would often let him NASA. It seemed it would just it delighted in thumbing his nose as master's uh, face. And one of the uh, this is all from Landon Carter's diary. And one of the stories that I put in the book uh, talks about how Landon Carter goes to a party at another plantation house, and when he leaves, he can't find NASA to drive him home because NASA is off dr- drinking somewhere, and Landon Carter ends up getting his carriage stuck in the mud, and there he's just pulling this thing out. And then along comes riding by, comes NASA and his son, you know, drunk as skunks, riding, laughing, and just leaving him in the mud. So there's this sense of the tension because of that uh, power on both sides of the relationship that had to do with the familiarity of culture. What did the, the, the slave barbers, were they able to gain some respect within elite white circles because of their gentility? Like, I think you gave an example of one guy who uh, did the hair for a lady. So I thought I didn't know this. So like back in the 18th century, when everyone wore powdered wigs, the ladies had to shave their heads. I didn't know that. Right. That's how the wigs were possible. And this, of course, is really surprising because later in the 19th century, uh, racial stereotypes change, and we get the notion that all black men secretly wish to rape white women. So you do everything possible. It's the whole foundation for segregation to keep them separate. And yet, in the years just after. Uh, the Haitian slave revolt, uh, Pierre Toussaint, who was a slave who left with his master's family after the Haitian slave revolt, he was part of this middling class of people of color who were mixed race, who were essentially the the middlemen, the su- supervisors, the managers on plantations in Haiti. So they had to flee uh, the island when, they're, when they had this successful slave revolt. And he ends up supporting his master's family living in New York City. And his real appeal is that people thought he was the perfect gentleman, so much so that one of his customers actually wrote an admiring biography of Toussaint. Yeah, it's nuts. And I thought it was crazy, too, where the, the slave or the former slave or the slave was supporting the, the master's family from his own pocket. Well, and as I discussed in the book, it really makes sense for him because um, rate black skin was associated with being degraded. And he actually, there are some letters uh, that he corresponds with friends where he talks about his frustration that whites just are incapable of of really understanding that he's a thinking person just like themselves. Um, So with Toussaint, he needed to support his um, master because he needs to have some claim to polite society. And so uh, by Living with his master, he was respectable, which made it acceptable for him to take care of these first-class women uh, who he was serving. Later on, uh, when he his master has passed away, he actually continues to hold 
dinner parties for his customers, but he will not sit and eat with the white people. So he's maintaining that distance, but by have, by entertaining, he keeps that connection to elite uh, genteel society. Right. And I think you, you talk about this too, it's sort of related that after the revolution, there began to be this emancipation of slaves in the North and in the upper South. Um, and I, you talk about how the former barber slaves would maintain connections with their former masters, even after they were freed in order to, I don't know, transition more smoothly to being a freedman. Right. And that, that relationship is important to think of. We think of emancipation means freedom, the uh, slaves you can free and go off and have a completely independent life. That was not possible because free blacks in the South had very limited legal rights. For example, if you own a business, you need to be able to collect debts. But since black people couldn't testify against whites in courts, it was a very practical matter that you had to have some kind of a white patron who would act on your behalf in, in circumstances such as that. And so, yeah, so many of them maintained uh, connections with them. Um, now, before the Civil War, we mentioned this earlier, most barbers were black and served primarily a white clientele. And because barber was considered a low status position, white people thought it was beneath them to do that. So um, black people stepped in to fill that position. But as you said earlier, at the very beginning, there's this weird uh, power social dynamic going on. You had a, a black man uh, who was seen as subservient, degraded, um, with a razor blade to the throat of a white man who thought who was in power. I mean, so what, what was the social dynamic like in the barber shops between a black business owner and a white patron during the, you know, the, before the civil war? Uh, I mean, that's a, an excellent question because it's a real ritual of power. Uh, when the white customer would come in, no matter if he was speaking to the shop's owner, no matter if he had known the, the barber for years, he would, feel free to, to command to know whether he had washed his hands recently or if the towel was clean. And so clearly asserting his authority over a black man, but then he gets in the chair and of course leans back and exposes his throat. Um, once he's lathered up, he can't even speak because if he opens his mouth, it'd be full of shaving cream. And my understanding of that is that it reaffirmed their greater power by being white because they had no question that black men were inferior to them. So that demonstrates their mastery to put the, their lives at risk by exposing their throat to a black man and knowing nothing would ever happen. And did the social dynamics differ depending on what part of the country where you were in? So if you were in, the, say, the northern states or the mid-Atlantic states or the deep south? Uh, well, there's two things to talk about that. First is people often assume this is a southern story. Uh, because most African-Americans live in the South, and it's not. Black barbers were the most consistently successful black businessmen throughout the entire country. And in fact, uh, there's good evidence that suggests the first black men to live in Chicago, Los Angeles, and Seattle were black barbers. Because this niche was so well established that they could go anywhere and open up a shop. But did that uh, did the dynamic change between black uh, business owners and their white clients, depending on what if they were in Chicago or New York or... Uh, Charleston? Um, before the Civil War, you really don't see any difference. And in fact, some British visitors who are really, they're very curious about this phenomenon because, you know, as one uh, English traveler wrote, um, you know, under most circumstances, you know, white men avoid being around black men. And then in this circumstance, they seem to love going to the barber shop. And they've noticed that was even true in New York City. And one a traveler gave the explanation that it allows them to be, you know, play the master in a society where there really aren't slaves anymore because you whites simply could get away with a certain demeanor with, with black servants that white servants would not tolerate. Now, after the war, civil war, everything changes because of course the Republican party is dominant in the North and it was the party of emancipation and uh, especially the best example is uh, George Myers, uh, the famous barber of Cleveland, Ohio, who was uh, a close friend of Mark Hanna. He got enough black votes at the convention to get William McKinley nominated uh, for the Republican Party's uh, nomination for president. And so he, there were barbers like Myers that played an active role in patronage politics because, of course, 
what would be the main thing the white men would talk about in the shop was politics, politics and business. And so they were in, in a context where Republican Party politics in the North made it acceptable for black men to participate. Um, the relationship was completely different because they were partners, unequal partners, um, in making sure that the Republican Party rode to victory at every election. And then in the South, it was probably not like that. No, not at all. Although, interestingly enough, um, John Rapier Sr., who lived in Florence, Alabama, had several of his sons became barbers, uh, and one of his sons actually became a Reconstruction congressman. But John Sr. was the first African-American official in the state of Alabama. And there's a petition, so we know why they decided to pick him. He was uh, a voting registrar, of all things, in Alabama. And people in the whites supporting this appointment wrote that, you know, we can trust our barber, John, to be conservative. So a Southern barber could be trusted to be discreet and to never challenge the social order in front of whites. I thought it was interesting, too. I had no idea about this, but, you know, before the Civil War, um, you know, despite being seen as a subservient occupation, black barbers became some of the wealthiest men uh, in antebellum America. I mean, some of them were leaving estates of $100,000 behind. I mean, any notable examples of financially successful black barbers that you came across? Um, well, you know, the interesting thing, I can tell you the names of people who had a lot of money, but they tended not to be people who were famous in other regards. Um, so I didn't focus on them as much. I think the, the larger issue is that um, collectively what the Knights of the Razor, as they like to call themselves, did is they were able to invent something new. They were, you know, a real entrepreneur where they're uh, not only risking their money, but they're coming up with a new innovative idea. And that idea was the first class barbershop. And what they were doing with this uh, in the 1820s, this fat hit American cities of having hotels that had what were referred to as saloons, which was a corruption of, of salon, which is a public room that you would find in an aristocratic house. And these were going to be palaces of the people. And the idea was that Americans can celebrate their equality and their prosperity by mingling together in these public settings where they were clearly very genteel. Um, so barbers, by adopting some of the trappings of a Victorian parlor, the drapes, the upholstery, so the the very first barber's chairs that we would recognize were adopted by black men. They'd have upholstered chairs that would recline, which was a considerable advance over what came before it. And of course, these are large establishments centrally located often in the town's leading hotel. And it's their development of, of service in, that included the experience of luxury that made them able to fend off white competitors for the rest of the 19th century. And of course, that's what le- led to the profit. But I thought it was interesting too. So you know, they were able to fend off white competitors. And we'll get into more about how um, white barbers kind of broke monopoly on the barber trade later on. But that was, you talk about some of these individuals who made lots of money, um, but they, they seem sort of ambivalent about their occupation. They're like, yeah, I, I made a lot of money but they still felt the sting of you know, low status because they were a barber. Uh, I think uh, you might be uh, referring to some of the comments made by black leaders such as Frederick Douglass or Martin Delaney or, or David Walker, who all at different points criticized barbers for pulling down the race uh, by reinforcing the stereotypes that black people are, are servile. Uh, this is something I'm actually I'm having students write a paper about this, where they're looking at these editorials and debating, you know, writing a paper talking about, you know, was that a fair criticism or not? And, you know, one of the things that came up in discussion with the students is there are some similar comments about rap stars today, like Flavor Flav. Many black people think make blacks look ridiculous. He's mainly selling albums to teenage white men. Um, so it's a similar phenomenon. We can we can understand it by comparison. Right, that is an interesting uh, comparison. Yeah, I thought that was interesting that, that black barbers had um, this very I mean, sort of in the African American community they had they were sort of ambivalent about barbers. On the one hand, they were proud of the the Knights of the Razor because they were entrepreneurial, they were business owners, they were it was a path to middle class living. But yeah, at the same time, as you said, Frederick Douglass criticized them because they were doing this um, 
through the, the role of a barber, which was a subservient position. Well, and you, and you have to, well, like I do in the book, you have to look at what Douglas was asking to see if it's reasonable, because you can get the idea that um, you're not, as people would say, representing well to, to play the fool and um, shuck and grin for white customers. But what Douglas, in a series of editorials that he published in his newspaper, um, called for parents to make their children mechanics and not waiters and barbers and other forms of servants. The problem with that is that, you know, it was not possible for the overwhelming majority of free black people to learn a trade because they, the white skilled craftsmen refused to train them as apprentices. Um, Frederick Douglass himself was a skilled ship's caulker uh, when he ran away from Maryland and gained his freedom and he was unable to gain employment in that trade in the North. I mean, part of what's going on is just it's an aspiration for the African-American community, again, to kind of draw a parallel to the present. Uh, that would be like a black leader today saying people in South Central L.A. need to become computer programmers because that's, you know, the cutting edge technology. It's the kind of expertise that's going to gain lots of money that that makes sense on the face of it. But it's unlikely that people have the skills or the access that they could actually do that. So that's why in the. A uh, book I agree with barbers who defended themselves and said that, look, you have to realize we are the majority of business owners and business ownership allows us to build churches and keep our wives at home and send our kids to school and promote a more respectable black elite. And, you know, going back to this idea of uh, job training, right? I mean, to telling uh, to become a mechanic, that was probably impossible because white people wouldn't train them, but within the Knights of the Razor, as they called themselves, they had, they created a, a, a journeyman's process, right? An apprenticeship process to um, train um, other black men on how to become a barber. Yeah. And that's uh, really something I think is really key to understanding not only why they were successful, because this is a book about business success by small entrepreneurs, but it's also about uh, why they've established a, a, a tradition of men supporting other men of mutual aid that continues to exist in today's barber shop. Um, one of the best sources for understanding antebellum traditions of, of working with apprentices and supporting them comes from an extraordinary document, which is the diary of William Johnson. William Johnson was a free black man. He was the leading black barber in Natchez, Mississippi, when it was the heart of the cotton kingdom in the 1830s and 1840s. He left behind a 2,000-page diary, which is the longest single narrative written by any African-American before the Civil War. Um, because he knew everyone, it's the best single source on the history of Natchez at that time. But for, for our purposes, it's really interesting to see what he wrote about. He, he had over 20 young men live in his house as apprentices. So this is uh, not the community college experience that we might picture with an apprentice now. Um, Families, often single mothers, uh, would drop their kid off with William Johnson when they were 10, 11, 12 years old. And the understanding was Johnson would not only teach them the barber trade or the tonsorial arts, as they were called, but uh, make sure they grew up to be respectable men who could read and write, who went to church. Um, and and it, it's very interesting to see. Johnson is a figure, he's, he had a white father and a black mother, so he's a man who's kind of in between. He doesn't fit in with the, the slave community, but the whites won't accept him. Some of these apprentices represent the only people that he could identify because they would come, often white fathers would place their illegitimate uh, mixed-race son with him. And so uh, he has, for example, one of those apprentices was William Winston, uh, who was named after Lieutenant Governor Winston of Mississippi, who was his father. And Johnson really takes a shine to Winston and, and being amused at him fighting back against the older boys or that he would not attend darky parties, that he, he was a more reserved, dignified person and ultimately ends up uh, helping Winston uh, gain his own shop as, so he can be an independent black barber. And this is, of course, the real tradition of mutual aid teach people to trade, but teach them how to be strong black men, help right. them become their own businessmen. And then when, you know, when other barbers would grow older, provide them with employment. Now at the end of the 19th century, 
this undergoes a, a dramatic transformation, and it has to do with the rise of black-owned business for black customers. With urban migration, African Americans finally have enough disposable income they can support, first off, their own black barbershops. Most African Americans before then had simply cut each other's hair at home. But more importantly, they can support um, insurance companies. And I think uh, maybe before you were want me to talk about Alonzo Herndon and John Merrick, who were two very wealthy barbers, Herndon in Atlanta, Merrick in Durham, North Carolina, each man established uh, insurance companies to sell insurance to blacks at a time when Prudential Insurance, for example, simply refused to write policies to black customers. They said they died. Their had mortality rate was too high. The reason I'm, I'm talking about these companies, though, is I've argued that Herndon and Merrick um, made their businesses so successful. And by the way, Merrick's North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company became the largest black-owned business in the world uh, up through the 1960s. And it was successful, though, because they were able to translate that tradition of mutual aid to selling insurance, to how they recruited and groomed and mentored young salesmen, made them district managers, had gather social gatherings that reflect what we saw barbers doing 50 years earlier. And so, there, you know, there is a direct connection between black business in the present, especially black barber shops, where it's about um, making sure that members of the community help each other and economic self-help and the traditions of these barbers in the 19th century who had very different lives because they served white customers. Well, I, I thought it was interesting, too. So in the, the, the sort of the in, tail end of the 19th century, you started to see a, a large increase of immigration from Europe, uh, from Germany, from Italy. And these people, a lot of the men, they were barbers. They came to be barbers and they started um, competing with black barbers in America. But you talk about in the book that even though there are these white men who were barbers offering the services, a lot of white men still preferred to be barbered by black barbers. Um, why was that? An immigrant was a white man. And that was not a clear marker of difference in status white men preferred to be waited by, on by someone who is clearly their inferior. Um, also, especially in the North, uh, with this competition, the, the farther South he went, the stronger was the hold of black barbers over white customers. Uh, but in the North, um, the other facet is the, in first class, class shops, the barbers had much more in common with their customers than the is the, an Italian immigrant. The, 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 turns out the skill that Italian immigrants in the late 19th century were most likely to bring from Italy was barbering. Uh, but so a black barber who's involved in Republican Party politics, uh, who has extensive business interest of his own, is going to have more in common with well-to-do white customers than a recent immigrant off the boat. Um, of course, this is all going to change. Uh, one thing I was hoping we'd have a chance to talk about is the impact of licensing and how that was used by uh, unions to exclude African-Americans ultimately from the trade. Yeah, let's talk about that. Because, yeah, in every state, you have to be licensed to be a barber. Right, and the origins of that, um, two, two things really contributed to that. And this both happens in the 1880s. The first is we start to get a more widespread understanding that germs cause disease. And a French scientist publishes an article that scandalizes people because he looks at a stipic pencil, which is what you use after you cut your face shaving, and found 60,000 different kinds of germs living on, on this. And there's this sense that barber shops are cesspools of, of uh, contagious disease. Um, at the same time, there's concerns about the sanitation of barber shops. We also see the first of the barber schools, so for-profit commercial barber schools. It was manned by a man named A.B. Moeller set these up all over the country, wrote textbooks. So he wrote the first text for barber colleges. And this created a flood of what were called cheap barbers because they were not very well trained and consequently couldn't charge much. And so they ruined the trade in a sense that they drove down prices for shaves and haircuts. And so a, a, there was a union, the Journeyman Barbers International Union of America, that was associated with the American Federation of Labor, the leaders, mostly second, third generation German Americans, saw their opportunity 
to seize on the issue of sanitation, to limit competition, and while they're at it, finally exclude the blacks in the first class barbershops. And the, the, the pretext for licensing laws was to ensure the sanitation of barbershops and protect public health. And the idea was, and they really traded on gross stereotypes about Italian immigrants or African Americans being disease carriers because they were unclean, uh, sexually promiscuous. And um, so starting in the 1880s, we see the first laws being passed. And for a while, uh, I had mentioned George Myers, the barber, the kingmaker uh, that helps William McKinley become president, who's barber in, in Cleveland. Men like him are able to fight back by buying, you know, retrofitting, reinventing the barbershop one more time. So it's something really closer to today where there's lots of sinks and uh, you sterilize combs and barbicide. And uh, they had elaborate steamers to uh, sterilize the razors and whatnot. So for a time being, black, the black barbers that owned the best shops were able to update to this new regime. But all in the long run, licensing driven by concerns about sanitation will exclude them. And then, of course, one thing I, I didn't get a chance to talk about in my book is when William Gillette invents his razor, he claims that this is the most sanitary option is to not have to go to the barber shop at all. And there are early ads that say, isn't it annoying when you go to the barber shop and your barber's hands smell like garlic and cheap cigars? And wouldn't you rather just shave yourself at home? So again, an appeal, greater sanitation and a chance to not associate with people who you consider your social inferiors. So besides licensing, what other factors eventually led to the segregation of the barbershop in America, where you have black barbers servicing primarily African-American men and white barbers pr servicing primarily white men. And even now, I mean, the white barbershop's kind of, it's kind of making a resurgent, but it's kind of defunct. Yeah, it, it's really the, the African-American community that's been loyal to its barbershops. Uh, it really has to do with the rise of segregation at the end of the 19th century. Um, it's ironic, you know, the barbers were criticized by black leaders because they wouldn't serve other black men. They had, they ran, in effect, segregated institutions. Um, but uh, as historians have shown, we, you know, the real fundamental change in race relations in the 1890s, that's when we see the height of lynching, for example. And increasingly, younger generations of white men do not want a black barber. Um, I actually found a gentleman named George Hall in Mobile back in the 1990s. And in the 20s, he had served in his uncle's barbershop in Mobile, where they still serve white men. But he said at that point, it was all very old men, and the younger men didn't come in the shop. So as race relations grew worse, whites became more reluctant. Younger whites became reluctant to go to black barbershops. But at the same time, um, the opportunity I discussed before, the greater earning power of, of wage earning urban black people meant that many of the barbers I studied simply just switched to serving black men, which, you know, in the long run was a more satisfying situation for them anyways. And why do you think the, the black barbershop has endured while the barbershop for, you know, in the white community hasn't fared so well? Well, it's that tradition of mutual aid, and I think it's reinforced. So there's this sense that a barber is something more than someone who's going to give you a haircut. This is a, a, a coach, a counselor, adv financial advisor. Uh, so their idea of taking care of barbers, taking care of each other, it extends to their customers, especially now that they have so much in common. They're the same race. They live in the same community. I think, too, though, uh, another reason why this is so particular to the African-American community is black barbershops reaffirm the masculinity of black men, which is questioned in many places that there are real men, a lot of stereotypes, for example, criti critical of people on public assistance that men don't, black men don't make good uh, providers and whatnot. So in mainstream life where they're worried about police profiling them in a black barbershop, they get respected as a man and taken seriously as a man, which is, you know, there are a few other places where they're going to find that. Well, Douglas, this has been a great conversation. Is there anywhere where people can go to learn more about the book? Yeah, they sure can. Uh, if they 
look at the Johns Hopkins University website. Uh, there's a couple links for videos I've made about the book. And, of course, you can get it on Amazon.com. It came out last year in paperback. So I hope people will take the opportunity to look at the book themselves. I hope they do. It's, really, it's a really fascinating part of history that gets overlooked. Well, Douglas Bristol, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Hey, Brad, it was really nice talking to you. Thanks for your time. My guest today was Douglas Bristol. He's the author of the book, Knights of the Razor, Black Barbers and Slavery and Freedom. It's available on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. Check it out. Also, check out our show notes at aom.is slash blackbarber, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.